Anyway, what I'd like to do is to tell you about um, the development of the antibody field and, in fact, where it's leading. And one direction it's leading to is the creation of a new molecule, at least I hope it's leading to this, uh, which we call bicycles. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, to follow on from uh, what Ralph said, is that the um, that antibodies in them in are currently uh, blockbuster drugs, but antibodies are not actually um, uh, sorry. Antibodies are normally directed against infectious disease, but actually in their blockbuster embodiment, antibodies are against cancer or inflammatory disease. They're not being used against the natural, uh, um, against their natural foes of bacteria and viruses. So this is just to remind you of, of what antibodies in nature do. Animals uh, make antibodies in response to foreign molecules. So they're called antigens and, uh, actually I can't even see, yes, okay. Um, and they've got several features that make them uh, um, able to exert their therapeutic action. In the first place, they, ha they bind to the antigen. So, for example, this end of the molecule here, the, the so-called variable region of the molecule, will bind to its target, which can be a virus or bacterium. And sometimes, that act of binding to the target uh, can be enough to block its activity. So simply it could bind to a virus and prevent that virus from being able to bind to the receptor on the cell that normally allows ingress of the virus. Um, the second thing, the second important feature antibodies have is that as well as having this blocking activity, they can have a killing activity. So the other end of the molecule down here, the so-called FC portion of the antibody, acts as a flag to the immune system. And this can recruit a whole variety of, um, of uh, uh, lymphoid cells, neutrophils, macrophages, NK cells, natural killer cells, that will um, attack the particular target. So, in fact, there's <coughs> several different kinds of receptor <coughs> excuse me, on this... Um, on the, on, on, the different tar, on the different lymphoid cells, uh, one, two, and three. And depending, and in fact, they, they, the distribution differs on these cells. And for example, neutrophils, if an antibody uh, is, is, is binding to a target, and then the other end of the antibody binds to a neutrophil, this can trigger uh, what's called a respiratory burst, which releases superoxide or peroxide at the target and acts to kill it. If we look at macrophages, macrophages um, are cells that will essentially eat the uh, uh, bacterium or virus, so they actually uh, uh, just phagocytose it, so that actually helps them to take, take them in and eat them. And then in particular, there are the NK cells, which, uh, if the antibody binds to this class of receptor called FCR gamma R3, is this will trigger uh, an event in those NK cells, which causes the cells to release uh, molecules that damage the membrane of, for example, a bacterium, and enzymes which effectively lead to holes being punched in to that particular organism. And so we have multiple killing mechanisms at the end of the antibody. There's a third feature. So we have binding antigens, we have killing. We also have another feature that makes antibodies uh, a very effective uh, uh, therapeutics, and that is they can stay in the serum for between about 14 to 28 days. And so that's the sort of half-life they've got. They, they um, achieve this by being big. So therefore, for example, if you were to take a small molecule drug, this would very quickly uh, be excreted through the kidneys. Um, if you take an antibody, it's a large structure, 150 kilodaltons, um, uh, uh, and this size, which is about 400 times bigger than a classical uh, pharmaceutical drug, means that it doesn't get filtered through the kidneys and it stays in the serum. In addition, um, any protein in the serum is normally subjected to a process called pinocytosis. So constantly in the liver and in the, in the blood vessels, 
uh, cells are constantly sipping part of the solution, part of the plasma, and they take this in and they destroy it. And antibodies uh, would be expected to suffer that fate, but they don't because there's a special recycling receptor that captures them inside the cell before they're taken to digestion and throws them out onto the cell surface. So they're recycled and antibodies achieve another uh, um, extension of half-life by virtue of escaping the natural mechanisms that would normally kill them or normally destroy them. So at the end of the last century, scientists, uh, sorry, the, the, sorry, two centuries ago, 1890s, scientists did try to um, make antibodies which are against infectious disease. Uh, they, they, they thought, well, maybe we could use these against cancer. So in the 1890s, um, at that stage it was von Behring had, uh, had already shown that you could make, you could, if you immunize horses with diphtheria toxin, you could make antibodies that would protect you against diphtheria toxin. There were some problems with those antibodies, but actually they were very useful for, 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 for patients who got, who got uh, infected with diphtheria. Um, but, he, but actually he and other people wondered is maybe you could do the same thing with cancer. So maybe if you injected cancer cell, human cancer cells into horses, and I think it was actually a group of Frenchmen who did this, um, uh, if you inject these cancer cells into horses, maybe those antibodies would also kill off the cancer cells. And in fact, they were not able to show that, but in principle they were right. And the reason they couldn't show it was because um, if you take a normal cell and a cancer cell, uh, they look pretty much the same there may be only one or two differences between them that will be evident on the surface. So therefore, actually, if you make antibodies against human cancer cells, you're also making antibodies against normal human cells as well, with the occasional antibody that might be directed against the cancer cell. So actually what you do is you end up injecting somebody with antibodies that are directed against their normal cells, which of course makes them rather sick and doesn't specifically target the tumour. But what uh, Cesar Milstein discovered in the... Um, in Cambridge in the 1970s was he found a way of taking this complexity of mixture uh, that we have uh, um, in antiserum where you've got lots of different antibodies with lots of different activities um, as might be raised by immunizing with a cell and finding in there the one you want. So he found ways of making monoclonal antibodies so he could select the particular antibody um, and then grow that up in large amounts and that was achieved by taking mice uh, immunizing them with, in the case, cancer cells or other cells, and fusing the antibody-producing cells, which are splenocytes, to give a hybrid cell line. And this generated mouse monoclonal antibodies. So now you had antibodies that were absolutely specific for the tumor and didn't bind to normal cells. What happens when you put them into patients? Well, they work at the beginning. But then because they're mouse, uh, the human sees them as being foreign, its immune system responds and starts to uh, react against those uh, antibodies and it results in human, an human anti-mouse antibodies that block the therapy. So the last um, 35 years or so has been involved with trying to find ways of overcoming that. And there are several ways of overcoming it and I've been involved in several of them. And the, the first approach was, could, could you try to turn these animal antibodies into uh, um, antibodies that are near human. Let's suppose you don't get all the way to being fully human, but suppose we get somewhere near Neanderthal man. Um, could we make an antibody that humans think at first sight is actually human? And there were approaches made to doing this were by genetic engineering. It was essentially a kind of alchemy, turning those mouse antibodies into human antibodies, and it relied on um, an understanding of how, uh, of the modular nature of antibodies. So antibodies I've shown you, they have this modular structure, this domain structure in the middle, this is the protein, but those domains, protein domains, are also arranged conveniently at the level of the genes. And that means then that genetic engineers can cut and paste these genes uh, together uh, to create novel types of antibodies. So you can move the domains about by essentially just cutting and pasting the unit of information which corresponds to, those, uh, corresponds to those genes. A second thing you need to know is at the end of the antibody molecule, where I've marked here, so the so-called V regions, is, a, is a, 
modular scaffold. It's a beta sheet scaffold on which are mounted six loops. And those six loops um, carry the antigen binding activity. And one of the ideas I had uh, many years ago was uh, maybe we could transfer the binding activity from mouse antibody by plugging just the loops, just these, just these loops, into a human antibody. So, and then maybe the antibody would work and we'd have effectively a human antibody. So this shows the first idea um, that people had was to take the entire antigen binding region, the so-called variable region, and plug that. So if this is the red mouse antibody, they have plugged it into an antibody that is largely human, but which the activity is carried is, is that of the mouse monoclonal antibody. They've done simply by cutting and pasting those genes there. What we wanted is, is could we just graph the loops and create an antibody that's even more human? In fact, it virtually looks, uh, uh, to a first approximation, it looks human, perhaps about 5% of mouse origin at those tips. Now, in fact, it turns out that that can be got to work. Um, we were able to develop general ways of turning mouse antibodies into human antibodies, and those could then go into patients for treatment. And I'll come to that in a moment, but I'll just get through the rest of the technology first. Now, another approach is, well, okay, so you found a way of making mouse antibodies into human for potential therapeutics, but what about, um, why don't you make human antibodies directly? Why are you bothering to go through all this mouse stuff? Well, th there's a, people did try, so if we look at the approaches that were taken to making human antibodies, there are various problems. The experiment that Milstein did with the, monk, with, the, um, with the mice was you inject large amounts of antigen in the presence of an adjuvant, which is rather unpleasant for the mice. Uh, you put it to the mice, you then rip out their spleens, you pull all the cells apart, and then you fuse those to a, a uh, myeloma cell line and you get the fusion. And clearly, you can't do that for ethical reasons for humans. You can't source the lymphocytes that are in the spleen. You can't inject people with large doses of cancer cells and such like that you can do to a mouse. Um, there were further issues that Milstein had found a cell line that would fuse with mouse lymphocytes, but actually he couldn't, people couldn't get stable cell lines that would fuse to human lymphocytes and not spit out all their chromosomes. So it turned out that there was lots of technical problems with doing it. But the biggest problem is, uh, if you want to make antibodies to uh, human self-antigens, so natural proteins in humans, um, uh, it's not easy to make them in humans because you don't, fortunately, you don't react against your own proteins. So you're tolerant to your own proteins. And on a cancer cell, those are your own proteins. You're tolerant. You ignore them. You don't see them as being foreign. And it's actually quite difficult in humans to break tolerance and to create human antibodies against human self-antigens. And frankly, if you did, uh, that you, you might get them to other things as well, and then essentially you may get some autoimmune disease. So there were all those problems, and so it was quite clear, you, if you want to make human antibodies, you can't make them in humans. And the solution was to make them in mice or in bacteria. And there's two types of solutions were developed. One was an approach developed by another scientist working with, um, had been working with Cesar Milstein, called Michael Neuberger, who's um, a colleague of mine in Cambridge, and he had the idea of making transgenic mice in which you put in human antibody genes. And so those mice have got, you get, you, you make knockout mice, you remove the natural mouse antibody genes, and you put in all the corresponding piece of human genes, and then you immunize those mice, and they'll produce human antibodies. And that works. It actually took a long time to develop it, but it does work. The approach I used was a bit different, and this was in a, in a kind of competition with an American group uh, from the Scripps. And this idea was, if you want to make human antibodies, maybe you could use the strategy of the master thief. So therefore, a, a top thief would, if he wanted to open an unknown lock, would have a huge bunch of keys, all of which are different. And then he'd just find out which of those keys opened the lock. So if you had a virtually infinite bunch of keys, you could open any lock in the universe. And we took the same view with antibodies. Maybe we could make huge libraries of antibodies, then we could test those out on the particular target we wanted to. But they had to be human antibodies. So, so then we'd have to find a way of 
which was the one that worked. So that's another issue. But first of all, the idea was to generate huge libraries and then to interrogate those libraries for the ones that work. And this strategy, this was a strategy used to create huge libraries. And um, this is, tries to simplify it. If you imagine you've got a lymphocyte, I can't actually see this thing at all here. Ah, here we go. I'll look at this side. I can see it more easily. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a, a lymphocyte. It's making an antibody A, which binds to target A. And the, it's got a particular combination. This is the region that binds to the target, the, the, the heavier light chain variable regions here. The tip of the antibody, as I've described earlier. And suppose we have another cell, which is producing antibody B, that binds to antigen B. This cell uh, will represent these regions by a uh, black and a green. So therefore, we've got these two different antibodies. They bind to two different targets. Suppose now we amplify up, we take these genes, and we rescue the genes from here, and we rescue the genes from here, and then we throw them together in new combinations. What we end up with is the two original combinations, and we end up with two new combinations. And so therefore, that means by taking two cells or two different sets of antibody genes and throwing them together at random, we've got the two originals and two new. And they're all genuine human antibodies. Because this is a genuine human antibody, this is a genuine human antibody. This region here, uh, we can compare off this green, we compare with that red, and we compare that red with that black. But they're all genuine antibodies. Now, let's suppose we took 1,000 antibodies and we recombine them. We then get a million combinations, of which 999,000 were new. So, for example, in our original combination that we have here, None of these would bind to, let's say, human self-antigen because the system is tolerized. So these are just antibodies that are around in your system. You know already that these things are tolerant to humans and therefore that you won't find either of these binding to a human target like a cancer cell. But actually, if we generate new combinations, this will have new binding activities and we can, maybe we can find something in there. So that was the idea. If you took a million antibodies, you'd have a thousand billion combinations, of which almost all of those would be uh, new combinations. So this gave us the way of creating huge libraries. Now we had to say, how do we fish out the ones that we want? And the idea here was that we take the, um, if, we, if, we, if we take the antibody genes, the, the heavy and light chain variable region genes, and we put these into a bacterial virus, if this bacterial virus makes the antibody, um, it, it, it will end, if we attach it genetically to a fusion protein, to, to the coat protein of the virus, it will end up being displayed on the surface of the virus um, in, in this way. So we'll have three copies of these different genes on the surface, and we've got it fused to the outer coat of the, vi of the virus. You might say, what's the point of that, doing that? The point of doing it is you now have a system that is selectable you can use Darwinian selection. So you have a phenotype and you have a genotype. So the phenotype is on the outside. Here you've got a genotype, so therefore if you can select according to the phenotype, you can actually rescue the genotype. So to give you an idea of how this works, let's imagine we've got a great soup of antibodies, a billion different antibodies, all of which got different activities, of which there's one in there that we actually want to, 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 we want to find out, one that binds to a target. So what do we do? We put the target on a column, we chemically stitch it to a column, and then we pour in this whole mix down the top. And we let it run through the column, and then we wash away all the ones that don't bind. The one we want, that we don't know what it is, will have bound to the column somewhere here. Now, in fact, in reality, those of you who are engineers will know you will never get a billion-fold enrichment. So let's suppose we get a thousand-fold enrichment. So if we, it binds to this column, we wash the column off with acid, it comes out, we can then take that material and grow it up in, bac in uh, bacteria, and then we can grow more of the same material and put it down a second column. And by repeating that process, we can get now a million-fold enrichment out of this total mixture. So that way, we can, get, we can select one in a billion by three rounds of selection by using this uh, phage. This is basically a very powerful Darwinian selection system. It's the simplest thing you could imagine creating, a simple uh, phenotype and a genotype tightly linked together. Now, we use that approach to create 
human antibodies so we could lift off the heavy and light chain genes that form the antigen binding activity from the antibody we got on the bacterial virus. And we could rebuild those into a complete antibody. Now we have a complete human antibody potentially against cancer cells. Um, actually, it's interesting. You can also use this method. So, so far I've described uh, making antibodies that, that fr from, from mice. So we start off with a mouse antibody, although in this case I've represented as a chimpanzee because I didn't have the corresponding mouse slide. Um, uh, and, and, uh, or we can start off and we can make human antibodies directly from human genes. But would there be a way of using, could we use the same technology to, make, to turn a mouse antibody into a genuine human antibody? In other words, to jump this gap, which so far, so there's no mouse, you start off with a mouse antibody, and could you use it to end up with an antibody, a human antibody with no mouse in it whatsoever? And for various reasons, which I won't go into, that was an attractive idea. And uh, perhaps I can explain the philosophy underlying the strategy we took. Uh, Theseus um, had a ship and he sailed off from Greece and went into the Trojan Wars and wandered around the Mediterranean, went through various shipwrecks. That ship was battered, broken, mended, repaired many times. And by the time he got back to Athens, that ship uh, actually uh, it looked the same, but actually there was probably only about one or two timbers in it that were the original timbers. So now, the ancient Greeks worried about that kind of thing. It posed a deep philosophical conundrum, probably worse than the conundrum of their currency, where you would, where, where you would say, okay, is that the ship of Theseus or not, given it has perhaps not a single timber left in it? So that's an elaborate thing. The, the more modern version of that is I have an axe from my grandfather and my, uh, um, it came all the way from my grandfather. My, my father changed the handle and I changed the head. Now, is that your grandfather's axe? Uh, it came from your grandfather's axe. It was imprinted by your grandfather's axe, but it isn't your grandfather's axe. So we decided to use the same approach. So this shows how use of Greek philosophy and the power of mathematical large numbers you can do some biology. And so we took a mouse antibody we took, a, we took the heavy and light chain genes, which are the bits that encode the antigen binding activity, and we uh, took the VH genes. In this case, it's half the binding site, half one of these, dom one of these domains at the end that are put together. We took, we took that, and we paired it with a large library of human light chains, and we end up with a half mouse, half human um, um, antibody which binds to the particular target because we use our selection process to fish out the half-human, half-mouse antibodies that work. Now what we can do is we can take this particular, uh, com this particular thing here and try to replace this by shuffling it with a large number of um, human heavy chains and then do the repeat selection. We end up with a pure human antibody, got no mouse in it whatsoever, but was created from that mouse antibody, all by using the power of Greek philosophy. Now, um, this actually was used to create the world's top-selling drug called Humira, this approach. So it may sound just like an airy-fairy academic tale, but actually that's what was used. So I've described here the technology. We started off probably 25 years ago with these polyclonal, 35 years ago with the polyclonal antibodies, the serum. And then by the time we've reached about 1990, we've actually can see very suddenly in this period, we've gone all the way from various types of derived mouse antibodies right the way through to human antibodies. And that had a big effect on the, uh, on the ability to use antibodies as pharmaceuticals. Previously, it wasn't possible because essentially you had a, a, just a, a mixture of things which might have a tiny bit of activity. And for a pharmaceutical, you need to have 100% of your chemically pure ingredient that you're going to put into a patient. And so with monoclonals and with the ability to make human versions and human versions of antibodies against human self-antigens, uh, that transformed the, the field. Now, this just shows you the effect of some of these. The, the big areas in which they've been used have been in, in cancer and in immune disorders. And this actually is an experiment. The first one at the top here is an experiment that we did in Cambridge. Um, actually, it was mainly with the clinician, Herman Waldman, um, and what we did is he had an antibody which was directed against uh, um, a marker on, 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 um, on B cells and T cells called CD52. And he'd made a rat antibody, 
and he realized this was going to be immunogenic in the patients. So he decided, uh, well, I was actually looking for a way of using my technology on a real antibody, a real therapeutic antibody, and he was looking for a technology. And we, 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 we met uh, with Cesar Milstein, and he, and he actually sort of introduced us to each other, and we went ahead and did this experiment. So we made an antibody, a humanized antibody, now called alemtuzumab. This was made in the laboratory, was put into patients in Cambridge, or a patient in Cambridge. And in those days, you could do experiments you wouldn't be permitted to do now. So that experiment involved uh, putting the, um, taking the antibody, which was in a, a hybridoma, and putting that into the peritoneal cavity of a rat. And that rat was about 50 yards from the patient. And that rat then gave the rat, uh, the rat started to, it grew up in the peritoneal cavity of the rat. It would start to produce the antibody. And then we took, then we extracted the antibody. It's produced at high levels inside the rat. Extracted the antibody from that, did an ammonium sulfate cut, and that went into the patient. I said to Herman, why don't we just put a rat cage on the bottom of his, of her bed, actually, because then we could just, you could see the whole operation. Anyway, they, they, they just, they, they, they didn't want to do that, and they wouldn't let me go in with my medical research um, council lab coat, because they thought it might look like we were experimenting. But actually, we were, and it worked beautifully, because this patient had a massive tumor in the spleen, and uh, several kilograms in weight, and a dose of antibody, or actually several doses over 30 days, resulted in complete destruction of this tumor mass. In fact, what we see here is the red is the 10-day line, so, and, and at the end, it's sort, of, it's sort of 30 days. You can't actually see anything there because we couldn't see any visible extent of the tumor. And so this is where it started, the, the, the black, and this is where this is 10 days. Now, the 10 days would have been as far as you could have gone with a rat antibody because essentially you start to make an immune response to things after 10 days. And this showed that we could go all the way to 30 days without, without confronting this rejection. So this was the humanized antibody with just the tips of the antibody grafted from the rat, and it looked pretty good. The other, the other area that antibodies have been used is for, is for this is actually where we take advantage of binding followed by killing. Um, antibodies can also be simply blockers, as I've mentioned, like dealing with some infectious diseases. And um, this shows here um, antibodies against an immune disorder. In this case, this is plaque psoriasis. And this was treated by the antibody that had been made by Greek philosophy. Right, so this was actually an antibody, an anti-TNF, which TNF is an inflammatory mediator, and the, the antibody Humira, otherwise known by adalimumab, um, what was used, was, was used to block TNF. In fact, the, the TNFs emerged from work in, in, fact, in London from a um, uh, uh, tiny manian, Mark Feldman, who uh, developed this class of reagents, but the particular one that we developed was, was, was based on the repertoires and the use of this uh, chain shuffling approach. And that antibody has very good properties, and that's now the world number one product. So this gives a flavor of what's been happening to pharmaceutical sales or the impact antibodies have had on pharmaceutical sales. So if we look here at the billion, this is 2010, billions of US dollars in, sale, in, in sales, this is global sales, of a range of products. We start off with the biggest selling product then was Lipitor. I, I grouped all the insulins together. Advair, which is a chemical for treating asthma, or mixture of chemicals supplied by GSK. We have Crestor, which is another statin. So as you might expect, in the sort of above $5 million here, in the top 10, we've got, there's a statins, which you might well expect because they've got a very large market. Um, but actually, the, within those top 10 drugs, these green things, they're all antibodies. So actually, by 2010, the, 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 essentially the best-selling in the top 10, the best-selling are antibodies, not chemicals. It's been a sudden transformation of the entire field, certainly in terms of profitability is concerned. Now, this is a very strange case because it's a case of pharmaceuticals. So I put these as pharmaceuticals. They're all sold by pharmaceutical companies, yet pharmaceutical companies paid very little part in them <coughs> in developing these at the beginning. And the reason that they, uh, 
played very little part in developing those was because the antibodies, the idea of using antibodies as pharmaceuticals um, was a new paradigm. <coughs> and you can see the problem they faced. If we, I've marked here the advantages in green and disadvantages of antibodies compared to chemicals, chemical drugs. So antibodies have a number of advantages compared to small molecule drugs. They bind tightly to the target. They bind only to the target. They bind tightly to the target because they're very big and you can get a large surface area of contact. They bind only to the target because they're also that, that convolution of surface area, convolution of surface means they can be very specific, like having a very elaborate key. They have a long serum half-life, so they can be around for 28 days. They recruit cell killing, so they can bring other cells in to kill. And they're big enough to block protein-protein interactions, like the interaction of TNF, the inflammatory mediator, with its receptor. Chemicals have difficulty doing any of this. They actually, it's difficult to make a chemical bind really tightly to a target, unless that's an enzyme, and it's a very long job to do that. Um, so really, chemicals, they also tend to be hydrophobic and they tend to drop into other places in a target like, like deep pockets which aren't the one you want them to go into and therefore you can find that you get off-target toxicity at a late stage in clinical trials. So you have a number of issues with chemicals uh, which you don't have with antibodies. But there are a number of issues with antibodies you don't have with chemicals which is antibodies have more difficulty getting deep into pockets they can't, they're big enough, they don't get out of the kidney, they don't get out of the blood either, very easily. Um, you can't get them into cells, whereas small molecule drugs get into cells and do works inside a cell. Antibodies operate on the surface of the cell. You, you, in case of a small molecule drug, you can chemically synthesize it, so that's actually rather cheaper than the large-scale fermentations you have to make with antibodies. And you can take them as a pill, antibodies you have to inject. And the problem was, large pharmaceutical companies looked at this and they really, to them, something with these, these were the characteristics of a drug. They didn't think about the possible advantages of an antibody. That was to them, that's pie in the sky, needs to be shown. So, obviously chemicals are bloody good drugs, as are antibodies, but the fact is they have different classes and one has to be open-minded enough to see when you have a change, sometimes it's not where you expect, it's in a rather different area and I think, by and large, they were rather locked into this chemical space and they didn't actually see the advantage of a different class, this different class of biologics, which is why the large pharmaceutical companies don't feature in the development of antibodies. It was all, bi it was all biotech, people like Genentech. Of course, later, large pharma would buy them up, but, but the early stage. So, so now you may wonder, well, what next? So we've got these antibodies, they're, they're, they're doing great stuff, attacking tumors and uh, uh, blocking rheumatoid arthritis and such like. What does the future hold? Are there any more paradigm shifts? And there might be. I thought I'd just quickly outline some of the things that I think that we could imagine uh, serious improvements being made with antibodies. So I think there'll be a phase of improvement. And I thought I'd just run through some of those to give you a flavor of what you might expect. The first thing is the serum half-life. So we could imagine with antibodies, you could either improve them by playing to their strengths, so improving these advantages, or you could imagine trying to overcome their disadvantages. I'm going to describe both types of approach. So the first one, the easiest, is to make them work even better than they do already, on the grounds that actually they will outcompete the first generation. Uh, in a way, it's a bit like toothpaste. Um, with toothpaste, you've got um, you know, you can have added fluoride or added stripes, added breath freshener. You can put the whole lot in. So your original basic toothpaste gets extra bits put in, which give it a marketing advantage. and may even give it, for all I know with toothpaste, a, a real advantage. Um, and I think in the case of antibodies, there's a great deal of interest in improving their properties by systematic engineering to give them an edge, either clinical or even just marketing. So, for example, increasing the serum half-life. So one possibility is uh, the serum half-life is dictated by its size, which we can't do anything about, or, and it's also dictated by its ability to be recycled. So what this shows here 
is the recycling reaction. This is a normal cell in the liver, for example, taking up a pinocytosing antibody. This is the antibody in the serum. It's going to be taken in normally and chomped up inside the cell, goes through these endosomes and is digested. But these endosomes have a little receptor which I've marked as blue, which is the recycling receptor, FCRN. And as this endosome acidifies, as the antibody is going to be going into an acid bath, what happens is that this receptor now binds tightly to the antibody and carries it out of, the, of, this, of, this, uh, of this thing. In fact, I can see what's happened is my dots have got displaced from the cell. These blue dots should be inside these cells capturing antibody. And I must have, I, shift, I just made a change before the talk. And I can see my blue dots have moved out of here. But they should be essentially capturing the antibody that they're in these originally, but they don't start binding until such point as, as you acidify and then it chucks it back out of the cell. Um, by the time it's reached the surface, that endosome is now neutral and the antibody can dissociate. And it turns out if you improve the capturing efficiency, of that receptor, so you make sure it binds tight bit acid pH and more tight bit acid pH than it normally does. You can, by making, if you can, if you can, if you can improve the rate of binding, if you can improve the affinity of binding, you can actually extend the half life of antibodies because you've improved this capture, you've improved this recycling process. And so, in fact, it's quite possible now to make antibodies uh, by making a mutation in this part of the antibody, a couple of base chain, a couple of um, uh, amino acid changes, you can make antibodies that will um, have a longer serum half-life. And Medimmune claimed to have antibodies that now last two months in the serum, have a half-life of two months rather than one month. Now that starts to become very attractive because if you imagine, if you're injecting somebody, if they could have an injection every four months or six months, and you could let the thing go through two or three half-lives, you had it, it was still in excess over your target, that becomes rather attractive than taking a pill every day. And that's one direction antibodies are going in by, by creating variants of antibodies which will last a very long time in the serum and therefore perhaps in the future we'll just have them once a year. It's once a year shot. You get a third of your blood pressure pills, um, take them, remember if you take them every day, you'd be able just to take one antibody and, or a shot of multiple antibodies um, at, uh, um, once a year rather like having a vaccination. There's another approach, which I, I won't go into really, but, but this involves you can also improve the half-lives of some antibodies by altering the binding characteristics of the antibody at this end. And the way that works is that quite often antibodies can be lost from the serum uh, because they're binding to the target and the target internalizes them. So th this shows a case of an antibody, uh, wild-type antibody going into the cell it's captured by the target, it doesn't manage to get recycled, it gets digested. So the target has dragged it in um, by, it, uh, the target has dragged the antibody in and you get a significant loss of antibody from the serum by this process. However, if you make a, new, if you make a, a mutant antibody, which, which in this binding region um, uh, has got histidine residues, these can charge up as you go, as you start to acidify and blow apart the interaction between the antibody and the, and the receptor it bound to on the cell surface, and this can then be recycled. So it's not dragged down into the endosomes down to hell, it's actually allowed to go through its normal recycling mechanism. So again, some engineering at this end of the antibody can be useful. Another aspect is souping up cell killing. So this is um, an, a, you know, another advantage of antibodies, they can kill very effectively. And this region of the antibody interacts with cellular receptors, but if you can improve the binding there, you can mean they work more efficiently. And this shows a picture here of a receptor which is in green, uh, interacting, this is a crystallographic structure of a complex, interacting with this end of the antibody. And in fact, by playing around either with mutations in the antibody or altering the glycosylation pattern, these are sugars in the middle, uh, you can get higher efficiency of binding of these FC receptors. And in fact, in some cases, it can be 100 times more potent than the original wild-type antibody by making these changes. So you need a 100 times lower dose of antibody to achieve its effect. So that's another area that's being developed at the moment and looks pretty exciting. Okay, so maybe we can add some extra features to antibodies.
you know, this is adding the fluoride or whatever. It's, it's not, not an advantage it's got already, so we've, we've, let's suppose we've dealt with all of those. Um, maybe we could put an additional activity on. Antibodies work, as I've explained, by recruiting other cells in to do the killing. But maybe you could make the antibody kill itself, I mean, kill, sorry, kill in its own right, without having to bring in other cells. So imagine you've got a tumour, and the antibody has got into the tumour, and you haven't got the lymphoid cells in the tumour to be able to achieve the killing. Then you're a bit stuffed, the antibody won't, won't kill, because you need those other cells. But suppose you attach a toxic chemical to it, so it goes into the tumour, it binds the tumour cell, and that's taken in by the tumour cell. Uh, if you've got a really toxic chemical on there, like, for example, metanzin, which is a cytotoxic, or orostatin, this can kill the cell in its own right. And in fact, Genentech have been engineering a number of their antibodies to have toxic metanzin attached to them, and this enhances their activity. So they actually use Herceptin, it's one of the big blockbusters now for breast cancer, it looks like it's more efficient if you conjugate it to um, uh, one of these highly toxic uh, either microtubule uh, inhibitors or, 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 or DNA intercalators, um, which work at very low concentration. And so this is certainly being very actively developed now. And then finally, you could imagine, if you wanted antibodies to work more efficiently, you could actually get into additional activity, which would be, which would be to... Uh, um, have two activities together in the same antibody. So people are now making combos of antibodies. The idea here would be, for example, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, you know that TNF is an inflammatory mediator, you know that IL-17A is an inflammatory mediator, and you know they can both contribute to rheumatoid arthritis. So maybe you could make an antibody that would both be an anti-TNF and an anti IL-17A. And there's a little company which by using this kind of repertoire technology but with another small protein makes a little pluggable module uh, which for example if the antibody, this is an anti-TNF antibody, you can plug on a module which carries the anti-IL-17 activity. So that antibody now has two activities and therefore can attack a particular inflammatory pathway from two independent directions. And this little company uh, which I consult for because I didn't think of the idea, it was a great idea, uh, but, but in fact, um, I think this looks extremely promising. Um, the issue is, of course, you then have to get all of these combinations through clinical trials and deal with the regulatory issues associated with using combinations. So let's look then. We've been through playing to the advantages, adding on new activities. What about this? Could we overcome the disadvantages? This is why I'd like to turn to bicycles. So, a lot of the advantages, sorry, a lot of the disadvantages of antibodies are due to their large size. So, in other words, their large size, indeed, it does rescue them from the, uh, it does stop them going through the kidney, but, but uh, actually, it also stops them going to the tissues. So, could we find ways, maybe, of, of getting them into the tissues by making them smaller? Could we make antibodies by chemical synthesis? So perhaps if we could make them smaller, we could chemically synthesize them. And uh, it was, at the moment, it's not feasible to make an antibody that's too big. You know, you're talking about hundreds of amino acids. But maybe we could make it much smaller, we could chemically synthesize it. So the idea here was, if we look at, this is a kind of shows you a humanized antibody. This is the tip, this is the region that carries the activity of the mouse antibody uh, against a particular target, a cancer cell. And in detail, as I showed before, this corresponds to a scaffold with six loops on it. Um, those six loops carry the activity, and really, the, 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 they have different lengths and different sequences according to the different antigen they bind. They're simply being held into place by the scaffold, so it's just holding them in the right orientation to be able to bind. So, the question is, if we wanted to shrink an antibody, the first obvious thing to do is get rid of all the scaffold and just focus on the loops. It, would there be a conceptual way of doing that? Well, not in that form. But then we can ask some other questions. Do we actually need six loops? And in fact, it turns out 
from experience I developed over a number of years, it became quite clear you don't need six loops. Some of those loops, loops in antibody don't do very much. They just happen to be there. I mean, they're just there, and they might make the odd interaction. But usually, the binding activity is concentrated sorry, in two or three different, uh, uh, perhaps, just, perhaps, perhaps even two loops in some cases. But most of the binding activity will come from two loops. So, okay, well, let's not bother with six loops. Maybe we'll just make two loops. And that becomes more interesting, because then you can imagine shrinking an antibody, and you can imagine taking one loop, another loop, and if we could hold them together, in this case, we've suggested this chemical here, um, which is uh, benzylic halide, um, we might be able to, to effectively use this as our scaffold, holding those two loops in position. In fact, we came across a reaction that had been done by some chemists in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in Holland uh, some time ago, and they were interested in making small peptide mimics for the purpose of making vaccines. And this reaction works very well in solution. You, you, can, you have to use some organic solvents, but essentially, if you take a peptide with three cysteines on it, and then you add this molecule to it, it will couple them very nicely and form a two-loop structure. So we thought, okay, so we can make two, maybe we can make two-loop structures, then how would we find out the structure we wanted? So we thought, well, let's go back and look at those, that bacterial virus experiment. Maybe we could get this chemical reaction to work on the surface of a bacterial virus. And what this shows you is the concept, because this is the bacterial virus here. We make a bacterial virus with a peptide fused to the coat protein, and so it displays the peptide on the outside, so this is a floppy, unstructured peptide. We have three cysteines in the peptide, these positions, and now we add this chemical to it, and it will react with those cysteines and hold that on the surface of the virus, hopefully in some kind of configuration that is potentially could mimic an antibody. And then we can go through all these selection procedures and we can fish out which one of those work. And what we can do is we can create very large repertoires by, of these by essentially encoding in the DNA a cysteine followed by, say, half a dozen random residues, another cysteine followed by half a dozen random residues, and that way create a very large repertoire of different structures. Well, the, the good news is this work was done by Christian Heinus, a postdoc who spent two years fiddling with the chemical conditions, so, to, fiddling with the conditions so we can get this to work on the bacterial viruses. Because I can assure you, if you use the conditions the chemists had described, uh, you kill off the bacterial virus. So we had to play around with conditions to avoid the whole thing becoming a gel, um, or actually just becoming totally non-infective. But generally, we can do it and take, we'd take a three-fold loss or something like that under the mildest conditions we can. We can create very large repertoires, a billion different uh, pe peptides, which are these bicyclic peptides. We can select them against a range of targets. And I don't have time to go into the results, but we can get, uh, if we line these up and we compare them with uh, antibodies and chemicals, I marked in green what we think we can achieve, um, and, and in white, those things that I'm not so sure about and have still to prove rigorously. But for example, because we can make these very large libraries, because they're peptide loops, and because they're, they're about 1,500 in molecular weight, about three times the size of a small chemical, um, but, but very much smaller than antibody, um, they, we are nevertheless able to get them to bind tightly to the target, um, because we, I guess we've, we've got lots of residues which can potentially hydrogen bond. In addition, we're selecting one, of, one from a billion, so we can actually got some very good criteria which chemists can never synthesize a, different, a billion different compounds and then try to work out which is the one that works. So I think that's one reason we get these very high bind, good binding activities. We can get down into the kind of picomolar range with these antibodies binding to, say, a protease. They're very specific. Um, so in fact, and indeed, we find we can block pr some protein-protein interactions with these. We think we should be able to 
recruit cell killing, namely if we just add one of those Genentech drugs to it, it should actually be able to kill if it's taken into cells. It can't recruit other cells, but it could very well be taken in and recruit cells. Long-term half-life is a bit of a problem because we don't have the recycling mechanisms, and these are small, and therefore they tend to come straight through the kidney. But if you put on them palmitic acid, they can then bind to serum albumin. They get carried around the serum in serum albumin, and that effectively bulks them up. But they can dissociate from serum albumin, so they can dissociate from there and go through to the tissues. So actually, it looks as though uh, we will never do as well as an antibody, but we can certainly uh, take the half-life into the order of a day or so, which actually is rather better than, than a small molecule drug would, would be. Um, we can target pockets, we've shown that. We can get it outside the blood because it's small enough, um, but we can't get into cells yet. It seems to get, it doesn't go in. Um, and, and we can't put it through the stomach, although it's quite resistant to proteases, not, it can't quite survive the full working over um, with the stomach juices. Um, so, but we can synthesize it. So these things are 15 residues long. We can make them in large amounts. We believe we should be able to make them very cheaply and the chemistry is very simple. So, I'll leave it at that. What I've tried to indicate there is how this sort of antibody revolution took place, the impact it's had, the fact there's still more to do, and the fact actually people are still thinking about other paradigms, other types of entities. And I always say, well, keep an open mind. I don't know whether bicycles will succeed. We set up a little company based, based on this technology. Um, it has four venture, big venture capitalists in there who, hope, who they believe it works, but you know, we just have to see whether it will or won't. I'd be very surprised if there wasn't some use for it. And I think that the, the kind of areas I can see an advantage would be because you can make chemical synthesis and, and you don't have to use tissue culture and you can get it outside the bloodstream. The disadvantages are going to be the shorter half-life and fewer effector mechanisms. You don't have ability to recruit other cells. But if you imagine using this as a topical on skin or lung, it may not matter. Um, you can imagine using it systemically with a drug conjugate. You can imagine using it as a short-term antagonist for flares. So you get immunological flares, which you may be able to block. Sometimes you need to block them for about half an hour or so to be medically useful. And finally, agonists so that when you trigger a biological reaction and that reaction continues, you don't really want to use antibodies for that. Because actually, you could trigger a reaction, as happened with Tegenero, and actually it may, be an un, it may be an unwanted reaction, and that can be very dangerous. So having something which you could tailor with a short half-life, short half-life agonist, could be very effective. So I'm sure in somewhere in those areas, bicycles will be useful, but I don't yet know exactly where they'll be positioned. And what we find is we talk to clinicians and get quite a few good ideas, actually. Um, but but, but, but we, we, we're not completely sure. The next biggest challenge is to take this technology and to find out, you might say, the killer application for, well, not to kill the patient, but the big application that one would want to use for that. And, and with that, I'd, I'd like to say thank you very much. And just to say how honored I feel to have received this um, uh, uh, lectureship and this, uh, this award um, from Ralph Cohn, who's, uh, who's actually, um, I came across just a few years ago, and, I, and I've been, and actually it's made me feel rather like a very ill-educated scientist, because he, as well as being very knowledgeable on all sorts of things, he's actually a superb musician, and he likes bar cantatas, which I love, but he can actually sing them, he can read the music, which I certainly can't. Um, and I think, actually, um, it, it's, 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 you're very lucky to have someone around. And in fact, you've probably got quite a few people around um, who are, are more than just scientists. They do other things, and they do those things well. Um, I haven't yet to aspire to that, but you know, one day, let's hope I will. Thank you. <laughs>